So with uh, school starting this past week, I, uh, I spent some time thinking about some of the things that you learn uh, when you're in school that you, at the time you don't think are all that important, but then they later prove to be valuable as you're trying to figure out and navigate life and all the stuff that, that comes with that. So for example, I thought about one thing in particular, uh, starting in about the third grade and continuing up into at least your, your freshman English classes, one of the things you're taught about is how to use what are called uh, figures of speech. You use them in your writing and hopefully in your conversations. If you want to get technical, there are a lot of different types of figures of speech that we use. There are metaphors, uh, similes, hyperbole, puns, euphemisms, and understatements. Uh, one of my favorite types is what's called an oxymoron. It's where you take two things that, that seem like they don't go together you put them together to create a new phrase, something that means something different. So you've heard some of these. You, you might use the phrase living dead, deafening silence, virtual reality, an open secret, uh, pretty ugly. Some of you are hoping for a short sermon. I can look around and see that already. Um, another type of figure of speech that you see is what's called a paradox. And it's similar to what you see with an oxymoron. It's a statement that appears to contradict itself, but then when you put it together, it has some element of truth in it. As you read through Scripture, you run into all kinds of, of paradoxical ideas that seem to apply to Christians. For example, there's a spot in the New Testament where Jesus says, the first will be last, and the last will be first. Then Paul says, we live by dying, and then Paul also says when we're weak, we're strong. And all those things, it doesn't seem like it goes together, but you, you put them together and they come out meaning something different. There's also the idea that all throughout the New Testament, those of us who are followers of Jesus are called saints, even though we know that we're sinners. And yet, somehow both of those things are true. That's especially true in the stories that we've been looking at from Luke chapter 5. So if you have your Bible or your phone... I want you to turn there, and for the last few weeks, we've been looking at, at four different scenes in this one chapter uh, that, when taken together, all form what we've called an origin story of the church. They, they paint us a picture of what a church is supposed to be and what it's been designed to look like. And one of the things you see woven throughout all four of these stories that, we're, that we've looked at and will continue to look at is what I call the, the paradox of the church. So, so just like there are these paradoxes that we all encounter as followers of Jesus, there's, there's this one big paradox that kind of defines the church. And really, if you go back and read about the early days of the church, you'll find that the church right from the very beginning has been built on this paradoxical idea. And here it is, if you're following along, the church exists more for outsiders than it does insiders. Now, as soon as you hear that, you may have, you may have questions, because in our world, any kind of club, any kind of organization that you join exists primarily for the people who are part of the club or part of the organization. So if you ever joined like a, a private club, you know that before you join, they will often give you a list of the benefits that you'll enjoy as a member of the club. So for example, you get access to the club's facility. So you can use the club's dining room, you can work out in the club's gym, you can play tennis on the club's courts, and you can do all those things because you're a member of the club. That's where the phrase, membership has its privileges, comes from. But if you're not careful, that same mindset can bleed over into the church, and those of us who are a part of the church can begin to operate under the false assumption that the church exists primarily to serve our needs and cater to our likes and dislike. So every song has to be a song that I like. I want to come in. I want it to be like my personal playlist. And the seating arrangement has to be something that's comfortable for me. And every program and every special event has to be something that I'm interested in. And when it comes to kids ministry, that has to be something that, that serves my kids and helps me be better people and better students and better athletes or whatever it is that you're most concerned about at the moment. And if we're not careful, that becomes the mindset, but that is not the purpose of the church. I love the way William Temple, who served as the Archbishop of Canterbury, said this. He said, the church is the only society that exists 
for the benefit of those who are not members. Now, you read that? It seems like a paradox, doesn't it? How can you have an organization whose primary purpose is to serve those outside the organization? And yet, when you read through the story of the early church, that's how they operate. Over and over again, you see Jesus and those who followed in his footsteps doing everything possible to reach people who were outside the family and bring them inside the family. But there's an inherent challenge that goes with that that every church has to guard against and it's it's this if over time a church does its job well if they if they experience success in reaching people who are outside the family and helping those people become members of the family eventually the people who were once outsiders become insiders and if they're not careful the people who were once outsiders who have now become insiders will begin to think like insiders. And that brings us to the story here in Luke chapter 5. Just set the scene for you. By this point, uh, Jesus' popularity has grown exponentially, and the news about all these miracles that he's performed has begun to spread so that everywhere he goes, huge crowds of people show up hoping that they'll have an experience with him like they've heard other people having experiences with him. And predictably, word of that eventually reaches the Jewish religious leaders. And rather than celebrating that, they immediately launch an investigation hoping to find something that's true of Jesus that they can use to discredit him so he won't be a threat to their power and their influence. So you get to verse 17 of Luke chapter 5. Jesus and his small entourage have just returned to this little village. It's called Capernaum. They've been out on this tour of Galilee, and Capernaum is where this chapter starts. It's where Peter was from, and most scholars believe that the story that we're getting ready to look at actually happened probably, most likely, at Peter's house. So here, here's Peter. They've just come back from this little tour of Galilee. All these people show up, and they descend on Peter's house. Verse 17 of Luke chapter 5. One day, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So here's, here's what he's saying. Then, just as now, people went to church for all kinds of different reasons. So he describes this crowd. He says there are some people that have traveled a long way to be there because they have questions. They're like us. They have some questions that they hope Jesus will be able to answer. They have some needs that they hope he'll be able to address. But then Luke mentions some other people who were there that day for a different reason. He calls them, he calls them the Pharisees. They're the, they're the religious leaders. And he says, they've come all the way from Jerusalem to be a part of what's happening at this house, but they're not really there because they have a desire to hear what Jesus has to say. Instead, they're there to evaluate what Jesus is saying. They've kind of set themselves up as the as the theology police. So they're there to take notes and, and fact check his sources and then issue the necessary rebuttals. They're not there because they're seeking something. They're there because they're skeptical of what's happening. And then you get to verse 18, and you're introduced to another group of guys, a smaller group of guys who have arrived at the party, only they're late. So here's what it says in verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Now, my suspicion is the reason these guys are there is because they've heard about what we talked about last week. They've heard about what Jesus did when he healed this leper, and at least one of them thought, you know, if Jesus could heal a leper, he may be able to help our paralyzed friends. So they go to this guy's house, they put him on some kind of a stretcher, some kind of a mat, and they physically carry him to Peter's house where they've heard that Jesus is staying. When they get there, they run into this problem, and the problem is there's a lot of people there. The living room is full. The courtyard is full. The street in front of the house is filled with people all waiting again, and they don't see a way. And so it's at that point that they do something. And rather than going home like most of us would, like, we'll wait till next week. Maybe we'll, No, they didn't do that. Instead, they, they do something that sounds so crazy that it's almost hard to believe this is a real story. Look at verse 19. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him 
on his, on his mat, through the tiles, into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what, had been, took what he had been lying on, and he went home praising God. Now earlier I mentioned what I think is the big paradox of the church. This idea that the church exists more for outsiders than insiders. But in this story, you run into three ongoing paradoxes that all are connected to the big paradox. And here's the, here's the first one. It's important to remember that people are more important than programs. I mean, if the church truly exists for people who are outside the family, rather than just catering to those inside the family, it's easy to think that, that our primary thing is to have programs that, that cater to the insiders. But one of the things you see in this story is that people are infinitely more important than programs. So in the early days of the church, every worship experience took place in one of two places. They were either in the outer courts of the temple or they met in somebody's house. And the way it would work, they would go to the house, everybody would pile in the living room, and then somewhere near the front, after everybody had assembled, somebody would stand up and they would lead in a few songs, they would have some prayers, and then somebody would either read from one of the Gospels or they'd read from one of the letters that later became part of the New Testament. And so what you see in, in this instance is the only thing, the only real difference between what they did and what we're doing is we're meeting in a building and they had Jesus as their preacher on this particular day. So in that, in that sense, you got the short end of the deal. But other than that, it looks a lot like what we do today. This is kind of a, a worship scene. This is kind of a, a church service that's taking place at, at Peter's house. And the question is, well, who goes to church services? And the answer is, there's a lot of people that go to church services, but one group who goes to a lot of church services are religious people. That's why in verse 17, Luke says that while Jesus is teaching, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are sitting there. And why are they there? They're there because that's what they do. They set themselves up as, as the evaluators. So they're there to critique and evaluate and correct. If you close your eyes, you can almost imagine them. They've got their, their notebooks open, and they're taking extensive notes about everything that Jesus is saying in hopes that he'll say something that they can later go back and, and use against him. So in that sense, they're there to experience the program. They want to be a part of the service. They're not really there to worship. They're there to evaluate. They want to hear what Jesus has to say, and then when it's over, they want to get with their friends and discuss what's been said. But then you get to verse 19, and this little group of guys who have carried their buddy to Jesus interrupt the program. And what's so cool about that, as you look at verse 20, is that rather than scolding them for interrupting his sermon or for disrupting you know, the, the carefully scripted flow of the service, Jesus instead welcomes this guy to the party when he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, immediately... That gets the attention of the religious people, right? They hear that, and they think, that doesn't sound right because only God can forgive sins. So what's this guy say? So immediately, they're ready to get back to the program because they want to hear Jesus explain what he's just said. But from Jesus' perspective, the person in front of him is a lot more important than the religious program. And sometimes in churches... We have a way of messing this up. And I don't know why we do it, but, but I know I'm guilty of it. Sometimes we get so obsessed with the mechanics involved in executing a kind of flawless worship program that we forget about the purpose of the worship experience to start with. So just to be clear, the reason we meet every Sunday at 9 and 11 is not so that we can produce some, you know, 
spectacular worship service with catchy videos and you know, professional music and some engaging sermon with seamless training. I mean, I'm, I'm for all those things. But that's not, that's not why we're here. Instead, the reason we gather is to honor God and to help people connect with God. Now, yes, we want to do things with excellence. Yes, we want to do all those things we talked about. But we also have to remember that when it comes to the church, people are a lot more important than any programs. Now, here's the second paradox you see in this, this scene. It's that things often get messy before they get better. In Mark's telling of this same story, which, by the way, he would have heard from Peter, whose house this most likely took place at. He, he makes it clear that these guys did not just like climb up on the roof and, and remove, you know, open some door. Instead, they, they dug a hole in the roof. So Mark chapter 2 verse 4 says like this, says, says they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the mat the man was lying on. So during that period, most, most homes had these these flat roofs and, and visible from the inside would be these uh, kind of primitive ceiling tiles. They look uh, similar to what we have today, but a little more primitive. And then on top of those ceiling tiles, they would have this mixture of grass and mud and clay, and they would mix all that together, and they would use that to insulate on top of those ceiling tiles. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to create a hole in the roof, you first had to dig through all that junk that was on top of those ceiling tiles. And then you dig through all that, you reach down, you either push through or pull out one of those ceiling tiles, and what would happen is all of that junk that was surrounding the top of that would begin to fall through that hole, and underneath you would have a huge mess. Now, if you're the homeowner, right, like if somebody did this at your house, you'd have some questions about that, right? I mean, here's Peter. We know he's a commercial fisherman. I mean, he's looking out, he's seeing those those bits and pieces start to fall. He begins to see the light break through his ceiling, and he knows that might be an expensive fix. And he also knows that somebody is going to have to clean up the mess that's been left behind. But it's interesting that as you read the story, Jesus doesn't seem at all concerned about any of those things. Instead, his immediate focus is on helping this man on the stretcher experience a fresh start in his relationship with God. It's, it's almost as if Jesus knew that when you're dealing with people, things tend to get messy before they get better. Now, we're going to talk about that more uh, next weekend. There's this cool story where Matthew, who's this tax collector, invites Jesus over to this dinner party and he invites all his buddies who are also tax collectors and sinners. So we're going to talk about how, how messy that can get. But let me, let me just remind you for now in case you've forgotten, when you're dealing with people, it gets messy because people are messy. The challenge in that, though, and every church has to guard against this, I'm afraid we have to guard against this too, is that as a general rule, we don't like messy. Like We like everything to be in its place. We want everything to to fit together, and sometimes we'll go out of our way to avoid messes, which means we do our best to stay away from messy people. But when you look at, when you look at Jesus' life, one of the things you discover is that sometimes you have to be willing to make a mess. Sometimes you have to be willing to, to put up with a mess in order for people to get better. And that leads right to the third thing you see in this passage. It's that, it's that personal salvation often requires a collective effort. So you get to verse uh, 20. There's something here that's it's easy to miss unless you're, you're paying close attention. I think it's one of the more interesting parts of the entire story. Here's what it says. It's, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Every time I read that, I can't help but wonder, like, if this guy's friends maybe weren't disappointed. I mean, the reason they brought their, their buddy to Jesus had nothing to do with his sins. They were there for his legs. They wanted his legs to work. So they hear that. It's like, man, it's great to have your sins forgiven, but what about his legs, man? What about helping this guy walk out of here? 
But what Jesus knew that the guy on the mat and his buddies didn't know or maybe had forgotten is that having your sins forgiven is infinitely more important than having your health restored or being healed of some kind of disease because even if you experience physical healing, you're still going to die. Like, you're going to die of something else, but you're still going to die. But to have your sins forgiven means that your eternity is now, is now settled, and that's, that's, that's way more important. But even that's not what I wanted you to notice. Instead, I want you to go back to that line. Right at the beginning of verse 20, where, it's, where Luke says, when Jesus saw their faith. Now, if you're like me, you read that, and you want to be like, wait a minute. What about the man's faith? In our culture, whenever we talk about faith, we think of individual faith. Sometimes we'll even use phrases like, faith is a personal decision, or a person's faith is a private matter. But when you look at this story, Luke indicates that this guy's salvation was more than a personal decision. It was the result of a collective effort. It was the faith of his friends that set him up to experience something that he could have never and would have never experienced on his own. And when he couldn't find a way to get there on his own, there were some other people that had to carry him to Jesus. Now, here's the deal. If you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to know that's your job. That's the only reason you're not already in heaven is because you have a job to do here, and it's a job that includes bringing other people to Jesus. As hard as it is, as messy as it can sometimes get, and as discouraging it can sometimes be, the reason you're here is to do what the guys in this story did. And one of the things you see as you look at how Luke describes this scene that unfolded at Peter's house that day is that this is not just a cool story about this moment where these friends did this cool thing for their buddy and he got healed and saved on the same day. Instead, what you see are two clearly contrasted ways of approaching life and ministry. So on one side, you've got this small group of men who may not have had all the answers, but they had this incredible passion to get their friend to Jesus, and they were willing to do whatever it took to make that happen. On the other hand, you've got a group of religious leaders who, as the scene unfolds, reveal themselves to be far more concerned with arguing over theology than they were reaching people. And admittedly, they'd read all the books, they'd sit in on all the lectures, but somewhere along the line, they had lost their focus on what really matters. Please understand, I'm not saying that theology and Bible study and what you believe don't matter. I'm not saying that. But if you get all of that right and you forget the purpose behind those things, you haven't accomplished anything. If you know, if you memorize every verse of the New Testament and you can answer every theological question and you never talk to anybody about Jesus, you have missed the point of what you've been reading. And you see that over and over and over again. As a church, we want to be more like the men who carried their friend to Jesus than we do the religious leaders. But as I said earlier, the tendency is that the longer you're an insider, the more you begin to think like an insider, and you lose your focus on the outside. But we don't want to do that. Earlier this week, I had uh, Jane Phillips paint a ceiling tile uh, for me. Now, admit, again, this is a little nicer than what they would have had, but on, on, on the other side of this, it says, remove the obstacles. And when this is done, uh, we're going to put this somewhere down in our conference room where all of the, a lot of the decisions that affect uh, the direction of our churches are made because I want this to serve as a, a visual reminder, a silent reminder, that with every decision we make, our job is to remove as many of the obstacles as we possibly can that stand between people who are outside the family and those who we're trying to reach to become part of the family. Our job, and sometimes churches do struggle with this, is not to put up more obstacles. It's not to say, hey, if you do this, 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 and this, you can become a member of God's family. No, our job 
is to tear those walls down, to create uh, further holes in the roof, metaphorically speaking, so that more and more people can find their way to Jesus. So we've got to do everything we can as a church to remove as many obstacles as we can while still being faithful to Scripture. That means we want to be a place that's not afraid to do impractical things, expensive things, innovative things, and even uncomfortable things, just like the guys in this story did, to reach people who are far from God and help them connect with God. But as I said last weekend, for us to do that, that means you have to do it. Mean, church is not a building. The church is the people inside the building. So inside your, your bulletin this morning, I hope you found a little card. I want you to take it out. If, you, if it fell out somewhere, you can grab one on your way out. Um, at the top of this, so I wanted this to look like a ceiling tile. I don't think I accomplished that, but whatever it looks like, maybe you can, maybe you can make sense of it. So at the top, you see that same phrase, remove the obstacles, and then underneath, there's a, there's a blank line, and then at the bottom, you'll see that, that verse we referenced from Mark 2 where it says they, they dug through this roof. And as, we, as you think about this, I want you to, to answer answer this question. I want you to use this line to answer this question. Who is your mat-bound friend? Maybe you have several, but, but you at least got one. Who is it that's already in your circle? Somebody you talk to, somebody you text with, somebody you spend time with every time you get a chance. And the idea of spending eternity apart from them breaks your heart. Who is that person? Or maybe another way to think, who, who is it that's already in your circle that you know it would require a miracle for them to initiate a relationship with Jesus? I want you to write that person's name on this line. In about three weeks, on September 10th, we're going to start our annual Back to Church Month. And we're going to go through a series we're calling uh, Flourish, and we're going to talk about what the New Testament says about flourishing in life and flourishing in relationships and all that. And our hope every year is that during that time, there'll be some people who either haven't gone to church in a long time or they've fallen out of the habit who will, will re-engage. But, but for that to happen, there's usually a lot of groundwork that needs to happen first. So there may be, there may be some, significant, some significant obstacles that, that need to be removed. There may be some ceiling tiles that need to be torn down. There may be some conversations that need to be had some questions that need to be answered, some prayers that need to be offered, and certainly need to be some invitations that need to be extended. So what I want you to do, take that card and write the name of that person, and then I want you to start looking for creative ways. Put the card somewhere you see it, should be reminded, and look for creative ways to start removing some of those obstacles, to start digging through some of those ceiling tiles. And it may be messy. I mean, it may get really messy, and it may get really uncomfortable, and it may require us as a church to do some things really different, but that's okay because that's what our job is. That's the reason we're here. And if we'll do the things that Jesus told us to do and the things that the early church modeled for us, we'll begin to see things that we can't yet imagine. Before we close today, though, there's one other group I want to talk to just real quick. So there are three, there are really three groups of people represented in the story. You have, you have the religious leaders who love to criticize everything and everybody. One of the things you read through the New Testament, they never say anything positive about anything. It's always negative. Then you have the guys who carried their friend to Jesus, but you also have this guy on the mat. And for some of you, what you need to acknowledge today is that is that it's not, it's not somebody else's name that needs to go here. It's your name. Because spiritually speaking, you're, you're the person on the mat. You're the person that needs to be rescued. You're the person who needs to have your sins forgiven. If that's your situation, I, I want you to know it can happen. You may not think it's possible. You may not understand how it's possible. But I want you to know that it is possible. As you get to the end of this story, after confronting the religious leaders, Jesus does a second thing that on the surface of it seems completely impossible when he heals this man of his paralysis. So after forgiving his sins, he comes back later 
and he heals this guy. And I want you to listen close to how this goes down. Verse 24 of uh, Luke 5. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and he went home praising God. Now check out this last verse, verse 26. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe, and they said, We have seen remarkable things today. That last line and where Luke uses remarkable things in Greek is the word paradoxos, where we get our English word paradox. So what Luke is saying is that the crowd dissipated that day. They went home talking about something they had seen that didn't make any sense. It looked like it couldn't be possible, and yet it turned out to be true. This guy that, that came in riding on a stretcher went home carrying that same stretcher, and that became part of his story. So for the rest of his life, what do you think he did? He told, he told everybody that would listen about what Jesus had done for him. And the same thing is possible for you. But it's that last line, that last word, in verse 26 that I want to draw your attention to. It's the word today. Now, one of the other paradoxes that you continually run into as you read the Bible is that today is always more important than tomorrow. Now, in our culture, we like to spend today preparing for tomorrow. So we talk about what we're going to do tomorrow or maybe the day after tomorrow or maybe you know some undefined tomorrow you know some undefined point in the future but in scripture the emphasis is always on today because today determines where you will be tomorrow and the reason that's true is because today is all you have and nobody's promised tomorrow so you think back over your life you you could make a list of people who you personally know who had all these big plans for what they were going to do tomorrow only to find out that today was all they had. So here's the deal. If you have something that you know you need to do, I want to encourage you to do it today and don't put it off until tomorrow because you don't know what tomorrow looks like. I want you to stand with me. The uh, band's going to come and and as we close today, we're going to sing uh, two final songs together. And if there's a decision that you need to make or some question that, that you need answered, if you just want to pray with somebody, you want somebody to sort of walk you through whatever this process looks like for you, uh, we love to do that. Maybe you're here and you're ready to become a, a member of, of this church family. Uh, we, want you to, we want you to do that. We want you to become an insider, but we want you to be an insider with a heart for for outsiders so if you're ready to do that we'd love to walk you through that process uh, David's over here I'll, I'll be over here if you want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody you just come meet one of us on this front row and we'll be glad to help you